Hi everyone, Jill here from Rewalk Robotics and welcome back to our next episode of Rewalk's Topics and Neuro Rehab webcast. Today we'll be talking with Abby Maye, physical therapist at Brooks Rehab Neuro Recovery Center. Abby graduated from the doctorate program at University of Augustine and her passion is gait training after neurologic injury. She has worked with many different types of exoskeletons and high-tech walking devices, including Cyberdyne, Indigo, Rewalk, Bioness, and most recently, Restore. Abby's talk today is highlighting a Restore case study that I think will help other clinicians in their thought process with adopting the technology. Hey, Abby, it's great to have you here today. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Jill. I'm a huge fan of the example that Brooks is setting with the Neuro Recovery Center model and your proactive approach to technology adoption. So I'm super excited to hear about some specifics surrounding your methodology with Restore Use. To our viewers, let us know in the comments section what ideas or questions pop up as you're watching. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. With that, Abby, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Jill. So the case study we have today is a patient that came to us um, wanting to just improve his overall function and his independence with his ambulation. So, um, okay, so he's a 59 year old male um, presenting with left, he had a left-sided CVA in April of 2020. Um, he did one month of inpatient rehab here at the Brooks Hospital and then was referred to outpatient um, ther physical therapy at a different Brooks location. So their main goal there was to get him back to walking without an assisted device and equal weight bearing. So when they came to me in December of 2020, um, he was walking just limited household distances, um, but with his caregiver or his wife, but no assisted device and no brace. Um, so they really wanted to push forward now and um, start fine tuning some things. So we started seeing him in February of 2021. And we saw him for two times a week for six weeks. So some of their goals that um, his wife and I um, kind of talked about with the patient was that we wanted to improve his gait speed and his mechanics and then decreasing his fall, his fall risk. Um, so he had to walk with someone at home because he was tripping a lot with his right um, paretic side. So he wanted to overall increase his independence at home. So some of the big things that we saw was he had a very big hip circumduction on the right side, which then led to a very wide base of support. Um, he also had some slight um, hemi neglect um, and some visual impairments that made the tripping and you know, hitting his right foot a little more than just his gait mechanics. Um, but he also had a decreased stance time on the right side and it, um, decreased step length and push off. So this is a video of him on his first day. Um, we really wanted to focus on not limiting how much plantar flexion he was getting because he had activation in plantar flexors and dorsiflexors. So we didn't want to just put on a brace and help him clear his foot so he didn't have to circumduct as much. So we chose the restore so that way we could work on plantar flexion and dorsiflexion at the same time. So this is a video from the first day and he was actually circumducting so bad that I had to sit on the side of the treadmill and um, keep him a little more narrow because he was stepping off of the belt. And then this is a side view here. So we started the um, restore in the assist mode at 80% dorsiflexion assist and 20% plantar flexion assist. And that first day he was ambulating, um, his meter walk without the restore was at 0.46 meters per second. So he was a household distance uh, or gate speed, but his six meter walk test was only 470 feet. And then his FDA, he was not able to perform without any assistance from us. And then in that beginning too, he was, um, I'll go um, here, he's only ambulating at 40% stance time on the right impaired side and 60% on his left side. So that was one of the big things that we saw 
um, with the restore giving us the feedback of his stance time. So some of the interventions that we did, um, like you saw in the videos, we started out with treadmill training with the restore. Um, we then switched to a different treadmill we have in the clinic that does virtual reality. Um, it's also a wider treadmill, so we didn't have to do any physical assistance, but we were able to put some visual cues on the treadmill belt to help with his foot placement. And then we were also um, switching in and out between the treadmill and just overground ambulation using the restore. So one of the good things with the restore is that you're able to change the assistance levels and um, assistance versus no assistance or the slack mode. So we would do that throughout the sessions also um, to see how much carryover we were getting with the assistance. So we, um, as he started to progress, we would go into um, walking over ground and on the virtual reality treadmill with obstacles. So adding in some of the dynamic balance components. And we eventually took him outdoors to walk over grass and gravel and um, different things he would have to see out in the community. So here's a video of the virtual reality treadmill. So here we have what we call the stepping stones and it's just um, the visual cue of where to place his foot. So it takes um, live feed and determine and tells us what his actual step length, step width and everything was. So we were able to make his steps a little more narrow. And then one of the good cues that we've learned with the restore was that taking, um, giving him the cue of a shorter step length to work on the quickness of the impaired side of getting that foot down helped to get him a more equal um, stance time. So at first we actually decreased the step length and made them equal. And then once he got very good at keeping a more equal stance time, we gradually would increase that step length to return back to a longer step length. So then this second video on the right here is um, what we call the obstacle avoidance. So it puts obstacles down on the treadmill that he has to either step over or around. So adding in some of that community ambulation and dynamic balance with using the restore. So um, at the end of the six weeks, we were able to decrease his or improve his stance time to 48% on the non-impaired side or the impaired side and 52% on the non-impaired limb. So here's a video of him walking without the restore at the end of the six weeks. Um, we ended up decreasing down the dorsiflexion assist to 50% and we increased his plantar flexion assist to 50%. So um, focused kind of switch gears and focus more on his propulsion and his push off and um, decreased how much dorsiflexion we were giving him. His 10 meter walk test improved to 0.59 meters per second. So um, approaching more of that community ambulation gate speed and his max was 0.67 meters per second. And then his six minute walk test actually almost doubled and improved to 778 feet. Um, I have another video here of him walking with the restore at that 50-50% assistance at the end of the six weeks. And then he was able to um, actually do the FGA now and scored a 13 out of 30. So still at fall risk, but definitely an improvement from where we saw him at the beginning. So um, other than his you know, improved um, gait speed and endurance with the test, we also saw major improvements with his push off, which then allowed him to get better foot clearance and decrease that circumduction. And his wife reported multiple times throughout the six weeks that she noticed he was not tripping as much. Um, he would walk into the kitchen and he wouldn't run into this, um, the ca kitchen cabinet. And she saw a lot of change at home with that. And then this is live feed of him on the treadmill and showing his step length and step stance time. 
So his stance time, like I said, improved to 48%, 52% um, at the end of the six weeks. And his step length difference was only one to four centimeters at the end of the six weeks. So beforehand, it was a lot different in um, length. All right, Jill, I'll return it back to you. Thanks, Abby. That was so great. I really, really love your focus on the patient family's goals and patient-specific cueing there, along with the restore technology to build a successful plan of care for that gentleman. Um, I have a few questions prepared for you because I know our viewers are going to want a little more and we all want to sort of pick your brain because it seems like <laughs> this went really well. So um, you did sort of touch on this a little bit, but if you could expand any on what about the Restore's specific capabilities led you to considering this particular patient as a good candidate for the technology? So when the patient and his wife came to us, one of their big things is they didn't want to add an assistive device or a brace that would limit him. So he had good plantar flexion and dorsiflexion activation. We just needed to tap into that a little more. So with the Restore, we were able to focus on both sides and not just one like you would in a standard AFO. So um, improving his plantar flexion strength with his dorsiflexion strength, which improved his propulsion, allowed him to clear his foot a lot better and not have to circumduct as much. So with all of that, then came better um, skate speed, step length, and toe clearance with being able to um, use plantar flexion assist while using the dorsiflexion assist. Awesome, right. Um, so more generally speaking then, so how do you see Restore fitting in across say the continuum of a patient's rehab journey post-stroke? So um, I really like this idea of the being able to utilize the plantar flexors because I feel like that gets missed a lot. Um, we tend to put them in an AFO early on to clear their foot. So that way we're able to start with gait um, training. So adding something in like this early on in the plan of care, I think would be very great. So we can um, decrease those compensations that they're getting and be able to retrain the way they're walking the way the body was intended to walk with um, pushing off the toes and not limiting them there um, and avoiding maybe that AFO in the long run, if we're able to give, you know, an active assist and dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, then we might be able to improve without needing that AFO. Nice. Yeah. So definitely like early on prevent those strategies from even sort of developing. And then mm -hmm. for those folks, maybe that did end up in an AFO down the road, like, this gentleman, was he in an AFO at all or he had never been? No. In so yeah, they never used an AFO and awesome. um, his other therapist that was seeing him before myself was very adamant on not putting a sing, you know, unilateral side assisted device to get that equal weight bearing. So nice. Um, yeah. Congrats to you guys for that. That's awesome. You guys are doing it right down there. Um, so one more thing you've touched on this a few times on um, the importance of propulsion, sort of a big, uh, mm -hmm keyword in the research and things these days. And so just from your own take, like what is your interpretation of the importance of propulsion and incorporating that in your treatment interventions? Yeah. So I actually started to kind of learn some of this. Um, I went to CSM as a student in 2018 and um, was sitting in on a talk about propulsion during gait in the post-stroke population. Um, and it's very interesting um, in an article by Zelik in 2016 that they found that the plantar flexors, plantar flexors actually produce two times the force as the hip flexors. Um, and I thought that's very interesting because as a new grad, I thought, you know, let's do some toe taps. Let's work on your hip flexors so we can clear your foot. Um, we have an AFO that'll help keep you in neutral. But a lot of times we, we weren't getting the results we wanted. so. Um, tapping into more of this plantar flexion strength to help them train to walk as the body was originally intended to, I think is um, an awesome way to kind of, we haven't seen anything technology that focuses on that. So um, another thing too, is if they have more propulsion, then that's less energy that they have. So lots of patients we've seen that they just get tired very early on and um, have trouble picking up the impaired side. So I think it's, uh, 
I think I'm gonna say this wrong, Lo- Lewek at all in 2018. Um, that Lewick? showed us, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that showed us um, the greater propulsion they have, the less energy expenditure it is for the body. And if these people have already, um, they most of them are deconditioned and don't have, you know, this overall strength that they did pre-stroke, then um, now it's costing more energy for them to ambulate. So if we um, focus some more on the propulsion area to decrease that energy expenditure, um, it'll help them in the wrong run be able to walk better and more efficiently. Yeah, maybe get back to life a little more, get back to work, all those good things. Yeah, that's a great study. Mike Lewick is actually uh, another topics in neuro um, host or guest that we had on in the past. So we love his work as well. Yes. Good pick. Excellent. Yes. (laughs) Well, thanks, Abby, for a great talk. And thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Thank you, too. And to our viewers, we hope that you've been finding these talks interesting and helpful. Don't forget to reach out in the comment section if Abby's talk sparked any questions or ideas. And please also make sure to like and subscribe using the buttons below. We hope you tune in again with us next time.